Okay, welcome to our Q&A with angel investors. I am so excited for this panel today. It's going to be a good one. Um, so for those of you that I haven't had the opportunity of meeting yet, my name is Rose Terry and I am the marketing manager and a senior innovation specialist at the Innovation Cluster. And I'm going to be the moderator for the panel today. And we are very, very excited because we have some really amazing people that are joining us today on this panel. However, I'm going to um, give you guys a little bit of an introduction. We're going to do an overview of angel investment, and then I'm going to introduce our panelists to get a little bit deeper into what exactly angel investment is all about and what to expect if you are looking for angel investment or if you are um, interested in becoming an angel investor. We have pulled quite a few different questions um, from the surveys that we have sent out for previous workshops. And we've also collected quite a few questions from clients that we actually work with at the Innovation Cluster. So um, these questions are coming from the community and we've thrown in some as well that we thought might be helpful. I'm just going to take a moment right now to share my screen with you. Okay. So, hopefully everyone can see this. Can we get a thumbs up from the people that um, have their videos on? Can we all see this screen? Perfect. So, the Angel, uh, the Angel Networks, specifically um, the Peterborough Region Angel Network, works very closely with the Innovation Cluster, so that's why we are hosting this today. So, welcome everyone to our Angel Investment Panel. Uh, at the Innovation Cluster, we are actually the region's lead organization um, for supporting innovation and technology startups, and we are very lucky, lucky to work with the Peterborough Region Angel Network um, because of that. So the network, the Angel Network itself, brings together individual investors from Peterborough and the Kawartha Lakes, and the angels in this network combine their wealth of knowledge and experience to collaborate and invest in early stage growth companies. So this angel network in particular, although we're lucky to have um, a panelist who participates in other angel networks, but the Peterborough Region Angel Network in particular um, focuses on specific areas of investment, including but not limited to information and communication technology, so ICT, uh, media technology, green technology or clean technology, and biotechnology and life sciences. Um, so I'm going to, oh, sorry, the innovation cluster, uh, for everyone um, that is not, you know, necessarily um, attuned with what we, are, what we are up to, we are a not-for-profit organization that specifically focuses on innovation and technology companies. And the only way that we are actually able to support these companies is through our core funding partners. So the logos that you see on the screen, including the Peterborough Region Angel Network, are our core funding partners and allow us to do the work that we do, which is awesome. So this is the subject that we are going to talk about today, which is investment during COVID-19. And um, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers in a moment. Um, but first I'm going to take you through this um, awesome uh, deck that actually was provided to us by one of our speakers today, one of our panelists named Frank. Um, we are lucky to, uh, as the Angel Network, work closely with NACO. Frank also works very closely with NACO. So we're going to give you an overview of what exactly NACO is um, and what angel investment is all about. So who are angel investors? Typically, when you are looking at who an angel investor is, they are successful, cashed out, or retired entrepreneurs and corporate executives. Um, they typically will invest their own money into a business, and usually that's in exchange for ownership, equity, or as a loan, as a convertible debt. Um, angel investors are definitely part of the startup ecosystem. They are financially sophisticated and have tons of industry experience. And generally, they will invest between um, 10,000 to 1 million dollars, okay? The next piece that I want to let everyone know about is uh, 
what an accredited investor is. So these are the pieces that are very important when it comes to understanding exactly what an accredited investor is. So generally they will um, either be alone or with a spouse. Um, their assets not including principal residents um, that have an aggregated re realizable value before taxes, but net of liabilities exceeding uh, $1 million or net income before taxes exceeding $200,000 in each of the past two years and a reasonable expectation of exceeding that, in net, that net income level in the current year or their net income before taxes together with spouse exceed $300,000 in each of the past two years and a reasonable expectation of exceeding that combined net income level in the current year. So we are, the panelists that we have today, they're all accredited investors, okay guys? One thing that's amazing about angels, um, one of the reasons that we love, you know, uh, promoting to our clients to work with angel investors is that they actually give more than just money, okay? Which is really awesome. So they bring um, obviously tons of expertise. They have tons of business acumen. Um, obviously they have experience in, in whatever area they've been working in themselves, but many of them have a portfolio of investment um, and they've been able to work with other startups in tons of different areas. So really these angel investors um, are, what we call smart money, right? They know they have a lot more to give than just the financial piece. So that's really important when you are thinking about angel investment. Uh, this is the angel group landscape. So when we're looking at angel groups, specifically thinking about Canada and Ontario, there are 45 plus angel groups in Canada and there's 13 angel groups in Ontario. Um, so I mean, this angel networks are interesting because a lot of the times, unless you're within kind of the network, you don't hear a lot about them, but there are quite a few of them um, when you actually look at these numbers. And, um, you know, even in the, with the Peterborough Region Angel Network, um, I believe we have about 40 angels that are, that are involved in that network, but John can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so these are some pretty cool numbers. If you take a look at the screen, um, one, of the, one of the big things that stand out here is that angel groups do not compete on deals, they syndicate. So um, one thing that's really neat about the angel groups is if they um, are, are interested in a pitch, they can work together to support that startup, which is another amazing thing. And I know that the Peterborough Region Angel Network definitely does a lot of that. Um, so 60% of angel deals are syndicated and the groups also work together to borrow um, expertise from one another. So the Peterborough uh, Region Angel Network does work with other angel groups for sure um, when it comes to looking at startups and, and working with startups. So uh, when we look at a typical angel network process, this is just kind of gives you an idea of what it would look like if you were looking for angel investment. Typically it's about four to 12 weeks, okay? So um, I know with the Peterborough Region Angel Network, typically you would submit your application through their website. Um, and then they obviously have some behind the scenes review and screening before they select eligible companies. Many of the times with um, the Peterborough Region Angel Network specifically, they work directly with the innovation cluster to support that. Um, then it would be about populating the data room. So company materials are uploaded on an accessible online database. And then um, the companies would actually deliver a pitch. And if there are any investors that are interested, then they would go into a deeper dive. So this is what a typical um, journey would look like, right? So um, you can actually see here on the screen how um, if you were to be looking for investment, which I'm sure many of you are that are on this call, how it would actually look like for you to go through this actual process, okay? And, um, and what the angels would be expecting from you. However, obviously, we are really lucky to have um, a panel that is going to talk a lot more in depth about this today. So 
that brings me to our panel. I hope you all enjoyed that brief overview. That was just to give you some background information before we get into uh, the actual panel today. So we are very, very lucky to have four incredible humans. I have the absolute pleasure of working with these guys often, and um, they have so much experience and so much knowledge to share with you. So I'm really happy that we have them all on the call today. Uh, the first, uh, I'm just going to give you a, a very brief bio on these guys. We do have a, a blog post that we just published yesterday. If you're interested in learning more about them, um, I encourage you to go check out that blog post. First up, we have Michael Skinner. Mike is uh, not only the CEO of the Innovation Cluster, but he is also a serial entrepreneur, and I mean serious serial entrepreneur, and he is an angel investor. So Mike's background in entrepreneurship helps the Innovation Cluster's clients to gain connections and knowledge as they grow. Next up, we have John Gillis. John is awesome. We love working with him at the Innovation Cluster too. John has an extensive background that has led him to become the president of the Innovation Cluster, um, which includes, but is definitely not limited to, um, he's an electrical engineer, he's founded companies, and he is also an angel investor as well. So we're very excited to have John on the call today. Next up, um, definitely someone that I love when he pops in here and there around the office <laughs> when we're normally open is Eve LaFortune, um, who is with us on the call today. Eve, um, his corporate career spans 20 plus years in various marketing and executive positions, most notably new business development as a country manager responsible for the introduction and growth of Gatorade Thirst Quencher. <laughs> um, but Eve, in his role today, he's actually the executive director of the Peterborough Region Angel Network, and he's invested himself in many companies throughout the region, um, and he supports so many companies through mentorship, so we're really lucky to have Eve as well. And last, but absolutely not least, we're very lucky to have Frank. Frank has over 35 years in business development, producing top sales with a career track record in delivering breakthrough revenue growth in Canadian, US, and international markets. And he is currently an angel investor. We have the opportunity of seeing him whenever he comes to town, which is awesome. And um, he's also affiliated with NACO and AIO as well. So please welcome our four panelists today. Yay! <laughs> All right, so I'm actually going to stop the screen share right now, and um, I would encourage everyone to place their uh, views to a speaker view so that you can um, get a good look at all of our speakers as they answer our questions today. And I'm going to start with some general questions and how this uh, panel is going to work is I'm going to ask a question. If one of our panelists feels that they can answer that question best, then they're going to step in and answer the question. And we're hoping for you know, around a minute answer. And then I'm going to ask if any of the panelists have anything to add to that answer as well. So the first question is actually for all of our um, angels, I guess, that we have on the call today. Uh, the first question is, what is your experience with investment? Who'd like to start? Mike? I can start that one if you want. Sure. sure. So my personal experience. So uh, I've been on a couple different sides. So uh, I'm an angel investor and have made, uh, you know, a number of angel investments, but, uh, but also spent a lot of time on the other side of the equation and doing pitches to, uh, so with Rainmaker, we obviously raise money um, with the Peterborough Angels, um, but also spent a lot of time working with bankers and, uh, and sort of private equity, which, you know, in family offices, which in many ways, the principles are, are the same as, as going after an angel. It's sort of the same criteria, which I know I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but again, my background's on been on both sides and uh, it's fun and exhilarating and, uh, and also it's challenging. Awesome, thanks, Mike. John, do you wanna speak yep, next? Sure. Um, the companies I've really gone and, and looked at in, in more detail and invested in are, are the clean tech sector. It's kind of a little bit of my background uh, when I first started working. So I do look at uh, clean tech. I've also been involved in, in the media side 
uh, on the technology, uh, which kind of excites me because it's so quickly moving. So um, I've been in it for a long time, since 2006. We haven't seen an exit yet, but we're anticipating some soon. So we're, we're hoping for the best. Awesome, thanks, John. Uh, Frank? Oh, you're muted, Frank. Let me unmute you here. Oh. That, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, listen, I, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you guys for having me. I'm a big fan of the uh, innovation cluster. Uh, I have a portfolio of about 17, and three of them are from uh, innovation cluster through Pran. And we did close the deals on Syndicate. Look, I have everything from ice cream and chimp treats to technologies that I swear to God, I have no idea what it does but they're doing quite well. Uh, that's what I love about the Angel Network. I rely on other people's experience because I don't understand all the technologies. I focus on the biz dev. Obviously today the hot stuff is uh, anything COVID. Um, a lot of companies have been pivoting uh, to address COVID uh, or looking at their technology to see if they can offer something in it uh, because they're getting a lot of attention from investors. Perfect, thank you, Frank. And last but not least, we have Eve. Um, so from an investing experience, I guess I would say in my corporate life, uh, I ran, uh, or was responsible for new business development. So that basically meant that I had to analyze a lot of, uh, material, a lot of data, look for, uh, seams, if you want to call it that, or, or, uh, opportunities in, uh, the market, given the, the sort of space that we were in, um, and then I had to pitch basically to get the funding in order to introduce those products. And one of the things that you learn in that is how to pitch basically. Um, then I was president of an early stage company for uh, a period of time. And boy, I bet I had to, and this is something that all of you folks that are out there um, trying to get this kind of stuff done, I'm sure you uh, will know this story. I had to pitch, I think, over 50 times uh, before I was able to uh, raise the kind of capital that we needed to move the company forward in, uh, in the level that we wanted to move it forward. And that meant pitching angels, that meant pitching, uh, you know, VC funds and every other thing you can possibly imagine. And again, you start to eventually learn, um, wow, I didn't do that pitch very well, or, or eventually you finally learn how to do it uh, reasonably well. So hopefully uh, you folks are going through the same, uh, the same process and we can help you a little bit today. Awesome, thank you. Thanks guys for answering that first question. Um, next, I want to move into a question that many companies are interested in the answer to, which is what types of com companies do you usually find angel investors are typically interested in? Who wants to take that question? Keith, yeah. I can start. Oh. Or John. Uh, um, Go ahead, John. Yeah. Sometimes it's not just the company that uh, we invest in, it's the, the people running it. So, I mean, <laughs> I take example, um, Ribbit being one example where Pran invested into, and I think the reason they've got such a high investment was because of their personalities and their drive. And if it wasn't for, for the two people running that company, I don't think they would have uh, received any investment. So typically uh, I look at uh, the people running the company and then what they have in technology. Would anyone like to add to that? Can I jump onto the rib? Oh, sir, go ahead, Eve. Um, Frank, you go ahead because you you were going <laughs> to add about that specifically, the ribbit thing. Eve, um, ribbit is a perfect example. Remember when I said to you, I really don't understand all the technologies. I'm not an expert in rewards, but you guys introduced me to them. I like what they were doing, but I took them to see the vice president of Air Miles, and they said, Frank, if you haven't invested, I would. To me, that spoke volumes, right? Then they took it from there. But I gotta tell you, absolutely right, Eve. Uh, it's the PPF, the people, the product, and the financials. 
And definitely the, the two individuals are very, very good, especially when you put them in front of a CEO of Air Miles and they rocked it, right? So yes, and again, kudos to your stable because they see there's something in the water out of Peterborough. <laughs> you don't want to drink the water in Peterborough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and and that's John saying that as an investor in a water uh, company. That's. <laughs> um, um, Eve, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I I I won't specifically speak to Rivet, but you asked about what kind of companies that uh, hmm. angels are investing in and are interested in. You know, angels come from all walks of business and so on. So they have a certain degree of knowledge about a uh, certain space. Naturally, they are a little bit more oriented to, the, to a space that they know about. The great thing, as Frank points out, though, is that that's one of the... Uh -oh. you, you have the opportunity of listening to someone who may have an expertise in a, in a, in a space that is associated with the presentation or the presenter's uh, uh, content. And then you go, oh, wow, that sounds uh, like you believe that's credible and so on. And that, as Frank pointed out, somebody with high credibility, uh, he was, in a, was able to sit in a room and hear that uh, person communicate that this actually does have some validity. So that's a good thing that we share together. Net net though, I would say there is no one type of investment. And Frank spoke to it about the 17 that, that, that he happens to be involved with and a number of others of us are involved with uh, mutual com or uh, numerous companies. And it literally goes from, wow, that's a, that's a food product, which you wouldn't think would be necessarily high tech, but they're uh, bringing in some value add somehow, producing it differently, processing it differently. Uh, to technology companies, uh, to apps, to all sorts of things. Um, there, so if you are innovating, there's, a, there's likely an angel uh, validity to what you're doing. There's probably going to be some, someone who knows about it, some level of interest, and then that, uh, that, that, that creates a, a bit of a top spin frequently in, in some of the meetings, to be honest. Great. Thank you, Eve. Uh, Mike, are you wanting to say something? Yeah, so if I could add to that, I mean, I think the, the one thing, um, for those of you who haven't, uh, you know, gone to an angel investment meeting, I mean, the one thing is, it's just typically rooted in a product. So, you know, angels typically, again, it could be a food product, it could be a digital piece of technology. Typically, we're looking for something that is unique. You know, it's not, uh, we're not necessarily investing in something where someone's already done it. And typically, it's not a services-based company. You know, angel investment money is is different from, borrowing money from a loan for example because typically for us we you know we're looking for a typically a seven to ten times return you know we're hoping to get a, a huge multiplier which means you're typically is disrupting some type of market and you're typically creating a product to do that the reason why the return is so high is because it's also high risk typically angels get involved when no one else is willing to, to get involved you sort of go the process is sort of friends and family um, you obviously your own capital then angels come in. So they're really typically the first group that doesn't have a relationship with you um, that's willing to take a risk on you. And so, you know, we know that many of the, the deals, you know, they say three out of 10 deals will be successful. And so you're kind of mapping that out that you need to get a good return on the ones that are successful to cover the ones that, ones that aren't. Um, but it has to be some type of product. And a lot of times we're looking for intellectual property, patents. It's not necessary, but what we want to know is what's the barrier? What's stopping someone else from coming into that market? Or in many ways, a big company, you know, a big company wants to pivot into your space. How do we make sure that you're gonna be able to compete with that large company? You have to have something that's, that's unique. Great, thank you, Mike. Thank you all so much for that answer. I think that really will help um, anyone who's interested in getting angel investment to understand exactly what um, investors are actually interested in when it comes to investing. Um, my next question is, um, what are the best practices 
for approaching an angel investor. And sorry, I have a follow up as well. So um, if once you answer that question, can you also say, um, outline the process of approaching an investor from start to finish? I know that we briefly showed that slide, but just it would be nice to hear from your perspective. So for example, if a company is interested in investment, where would they start? And um, what's the relationship following the investment? I can start. Yes. If you'd like. Sure. Yeah. I think um, one of the key things, and it's one of the reasons off of a founding principle why the innovation cluster and, and the angel network are so tight together is that it is always easier to approach the angel network with a bit of a soft handoff. So I'm not saying you have to be a part of the innovation cluster, but it, it does help, for example, being part of some type of innovation cluster. Sometimes that soft handoff comes from you received investment from another angel network and you're coming to us. And sometimes that is because you've done your research and you figured out who an angel is inside of our ecosystem. You've approached that one angel, maybe it's a friend of your family or an uncle's friend or something. And so you kind of use that social network to, to find an individual, get that soft handoff. And, and why that's important is, you know, we'll talk a bit, I think, later on about what's, you know, what's included in your pitch and what those pieces are. But a lot of it comes down to trust and risk. You know, if someone is willing to trust you because they're giving you their money, it's a lot easier if that trust has come from a, a soft relationship where someone else has sort of recommended you, forward you through. And so I think it's key to have that, that piece for sure. Great. Thanks, Mike. Would anyone like to add to that? Yeah, I will. Um, sure. One thing I want to clarify is that normally angels don't invest uh, singularly. We invest as a group. So typically, Anybody that wants to approach the angel network in Peterborough would have to go through the innovation cluster or the uh, website for the Peterborough angel network. And then from there, it goes through an interview process. So firstly, um, I think it would be meaningless if you were to approach uh, a single angel because they normally don't uh, invest uh, on their own. They typically invest as a group. And that's really important when you do invest as a group. Um, typically, and everybody kind of said that in their last statement, is that we're not experts on everything. So we typically invest with the lead investor that might know something or be an expert in that technology sector. So typically, there's a comfort zone uh, when you do have a lead investor. And that's kind of what we hope to look for when you do approach the angel group. Great, that's a great point, Sean, thanks. Would anyone else like to add to that? Frank, yeah. Oh, sorry, you're muted here. No. There you um, go. Yeah, listen, um, as you know, I'm, I'm with seven angel groups um, and we all work together uh, to close the deals. Um, but, but what I would say is that it doesn't matter which angel group you approach. Of course, we as Pran introduce companies, uh, the ones that I've been involved with to other angel groups and we collaborate. But at the end of the day, they're going to ask you for some information. The one thing that I did want to add in addition to what everybody else is saying, there seems to be a shift where people are starting to understand that when you're talking to investors, if you want to get their attention, don't talk too much about the product. Talk about the marketplace. 65% of companies that fail don't fail because the technology is not awesome and the people are not awesome is they haven't figured out who's going to buy it and how they're going to sell it and all that. So what I like to do it, because I said, I don't understand all the technologies. Um, I, my best friend and mentor is Angelo Del Duca. He's an engineer. Honest to God, sometimes I say to him, Angelo, what are they talking about? But as soon as I hear some big companies that validated that technology, I perk up, right? Because to me, that shows. But listen, I've also invested in some companies where it was just a germ of an idea right through Peterborough, right? Uh, but there is no one recipe. But if you want to uh, get angels involved, there are uh, an angel group, uh, Angel Investors Ontario. Uh, there's a resource of 13 angel groups there. And of course, Peterborough Angel Group is one of those. And I also want to add that we help you startups. It's not about coming with us with the final solution and everything's ready to go. If we see something, we will work with you. That's the beauty. So that when I take you to an angel group and I recommend Ribbit, I've already le led with technology and my money. Sorry, I've already led with my money. It, I, I, nothing speaks louder than validating, no different than a client with a customer or an investor saying, I already invested in this company. I hope that helps. Great answer, thank you. Would anyone like to add to that before we move to our next question? Uh, I will just yeah. add, um, 
to what uh, has been said already, and I'm speaking very specifically about Pran, about Peterborough. Um, the best practice is to get involved. You may not necessarily be a, a, a client or whatever, but the innovation cluster is without question the best gateway to get to the Peterborough Angels. And that is because they have resources that can help you understand whether you are angel ready, um, whether your, your presentation is at the stage where it, it gives you the most opportunity to have a successful outcome. You don't want to get in front of angels and, um, and, and, and leave too much to chance. You want to be in the, in, you want to have your best shot. You give it your best shot. And the innovation cluster, we work with them uh, very closely and they, they make a huge difference in that, in that process. So just wanted that, uh, to put that out there. Great, thanks Eve, love the shout out. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to our next question now because I think you guys gave some very well-rounded answers for that one. My next question is what are the impacts, I know that it's still early, but what are the impacts of COVID-19 on angel investment? Would anyone like to tackle that question? I would like sure. to actually flip that over to Frank because he's really involved with this right now. So maybe okay. you, uh, you could comment um, on that, Frank. Well, thank you for yeah, that, Frank. Eve. <laughs> hey, by the way, thanks for allowing me to put on a dress shirt. I've been wearing nothing but t-shirts and frack pants. Um, <laughs> so listen, uh, the message that I would like to uh, give to the startups out there, incubators, angel groups uh, that may be listening in addition to PRAN members is, um, know that a lot of people are talking to Fed and provincial governments. Look, last week we had the closure of a, a humongous innovation hub downtown Toronto called 111, which was backed by Omers and Oxford. Okay, so so things are changing. But the message that I do want to get to you is, Aniv, you've been in, involved with some of these conversations. Angel Investors Ontario, which is the Ontario body of the 13 angel groups, have had a lot of conversation and continue to this day to ask, for example, for loans, where uh, matching loans of the investments made by the angels, right? Interest-free loans for a period of time. So there's a lot of activity. Um, to be quite honest, my frustration has been that I can't keep track of all these things that are coming down. IRAP announced a $250 million for high growth companies. BBC has made announcements. Um, there's a, it's a website, it's not my accountant, but uh, I got it to the Chamber of Commerce and it's called Baker Tilly, B -A Baker, T I L L Y dot C A. It's actually an accounting firm. Uh, and they've done a masterful job of capturing everything that's been announced at the provincial and federal level and breaking it down in a simple chart. And it's right in their home uh, page. So I encourage you to visit it. Uh, Beta Kit, also another great resource to see what's going on and the impacts. And then also NACO, builtbyangels.com. Built by Angels has a lot of resources. So the message is, uh, Minister Jolie, economic uh, uh, minister for federal, said this, because we've been having these weekly conversations, and basically she said this, listen, we know you're hurting, We're, we are here, we want you to be positive, we will get you to the other side of the bridge. And that's pretty much what she said, I'm paraphrasing, but that was very encouraging, that Minister Baines, science and innovation, Minister Ng, small business, um, Minister, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Minister Jolie, they're all very supportive and hear your, your pain. And so we want you to know as angels that we're in there with you. But also remember that innovation hubs and angel groups are the same. You know, we need more resources than ever to continue to help you because we're also not-for-profits. Sorry, I know that's quite a bit, but please know that we are, the conversations are going right now and things are happening, and some things have been announced, and more is to come. 
Great, thank you so much for that answer, Frank. Um, those are some fantastic resources as well. I totally agree. Um, would anyone like to add to that? I, I will um, add a, a little bit to it in that we are used to having <clears throat> meetings where uh, we are face to face with entrepreneurs where we have a, a room full of our, our uh, uh, peers and so on as, as angels and where we share. You know, the, the Zoom is an, is an amazing technology I, I, that I basically didn't essentially know about before, the, uh, before COVID. It is working pretty darn well. Uh, John has uh, hosted a number of meetings that that we've been involved with with the uh, Peterborough Angels, uh, Frank has has just spoken about meetings with uh, ministers. There's now I think with NACO they are doing a, a weekly event with over two thousand people involved in Zoom meetings. So, so the technology at first, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be so difficult, but. I'm uh, optimistic um, that this technology is making the, the best out of what I would call a, a bad situation. So you don't have to feel like, oh my goodness, this, this can't happen. Uh, I do know that angels are actually making investments still on, uh, um, with this kind of uh, format. Having said that, not, no, you know, no uh, sugar coating. It's, it's probably a tougher environment to raise funds because let's face it, angels, I think whatever it was at the beginning, um, I, I thought Rose was going to say, oh, here's what an accredited investor is. And then I was going to laugh and say, yes, was that before COVID or after COVID? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everybody's lost some money and, uh, and nobody loves doing that. And so, you know, there's a, some gun shy, but then the reality is some people have, uh, are have done well believe it or not and so you know don't stop Rose um, yes. can I just can I just add that we've done some surveys Eve you've been involved in some of these surveys where we surveyed all the accredited investors so through AIO there's 1600 of us on, and Pran of course there's our 40 to 50 um, about 70 percent said that they're just gonna carry on however they're gonna be a little bit more selective so be better you know, this is a great opportunity to refocus. See if your added value can be increased. You know, maybe you want to build that sales funnel. There's a lot of reception out there because it's a captured environment. And I hate to say it, people are nicer. People are very much nicer these days. So, so it's not doom and gloom, but also you have a voice. Tomorrow Eve, there's a podcast with all these people across the country. Jump on, send your messages to the ministers. They're online. Tomorrow it's with the parliamentary, the parliamentary secretary. Okay, so you're, you said it, Don't, it's not doom and gloom, be optimistic, we're very good at what we do, and you're entrepreneurs, <laughs> so don't forget that, you never give up. Yeah. That's yeah, great, I, thank I've, you. I've got to follow up on that too, is that I think um, the angels will be a lot more selective, though some of the loss was strictly on paper, um, that we, that Eastwood talked about that gives an opportunity for angels to look at reinvesting some of their loss into hopefully some companies that come out of this shining. And we've seen a lot of new technologies evolve because of COVID-19. So mm -hmm. some of these uh, exciting technologies that are coming out will certainly excite the angel group. And if they were ever to come forward to the angel groups, I would imagine they would get quite a bit investment through each group. So, I, I see it as a positive um, to park your money somewhere else in something that could be very exciting. Yeah, I, I agree with John as well. I mean, typically an angel will put up to 5% of their portfolio at risk. And so obviously, you know, if the rest of the portfolio is in, you know, assets, hard assets, or, or obviously the stock market, that 5% number might be smaller. Um, but then depending on where you are in your, in your career, in your life, if you're, you want to push the envelope a little bit in order to try and get back some of that money. You know, one of the easiest ways to do that is, is a good bet on, uh, on a good company. So I think John's right. And, and so is Frank and Eve, I mean, they'll be a lot more selective, but if you truly do have a good business and if 
you can reduce that risk and really show that you're going to have a good reward for that angel on the other end, I think you're going to see them jump at it in order to try and balance that portfolio out and to recover a bit. And then one thing I just want to throw out there is we, we talk obviously about COVID all the time and, uh, and COVID's obviously, it's a key thing right now, but because of COVID people have lost, um, I think lost the fact that also the oil industry has taken a massive hit. Yeah. So a lot of ETFs and a lot of financial kind of solid resources that people had, which had, uh, had, re had oil base as that is also taking a hit. And so, you know, if your company is in the clean tech space, for example, and you're looking for clean tech investment, you know, we know there's money that's going to be going into that to, as an alternative and you might be able to ride that wave as well. And, and the very last thing is, you know, I think being very cognizant of, of what the government support is as well. You know, when the government does, you know, get involved in, in angel deals and helping sort of, in some cases, pick, you know, pick winners and losers based on, uh, on maybe a priority, you know, whether it's environment or uh, returning manufacturing back to Canada. I think there'll be lots of programs that if you're, if you've got to be a very astute um, individual looking for angel money, I think they'll be able to leverage that in order to very quickly uh, to move into that space as well. That leads me perfectly into the next question. Thank you, Mike, <laughs> which is, um, how is the government and NACO specifically supporting angel investment right now? Um, I know there may not be anything concrete, but can you speak to what's actually going on um, in terms of government support and NACO support? I think we're giving that one to Frank. Um, Frank? To be quite frank, to be quite frank, haha. <laughs> um, look, I'm a volunteer for the National Angel Capital Organization. Um, I can't tell you that the CEO, Claudio, daily has meetings with both federal and provincial. Um, do I know the conversations in detail? No. We've been running the, we started with four weekly bot, prod, podcasts. Um, the very first one we had 700 jump, sorry, 400, then it went up to 700. There's usually a following and the conversation is there. Um, every time I ask Claudio, what, why is this particular person on the panel? He says, Frank, it's all about unleashing capital and resources. So the more capital and resources we can unleash for entrepreneurs, for incubators, and for angel groups. Um, you know, all the angel groups lost all their funding. AIO, the angel group was lost, right? And so it, again, we are not for profit. So I can't speak specifically what is happening behind the curtains. Um, Eve, I would suggest though, uh, and Claudio is accommodating, having meetings with innovation clusters. Uh, the innovation cluster is a member of the National Angel Capital Organization, and its mission is to work with incubators, accelerators, and startups to help them bring to life, right? But they do a lot of lobbying to the government. So between the good work at AIO, the good work at NACO, I think these things are going to be positive, right? So maybe what we can do, Eve, is offer where we can have uh, Claudio uh, where he's doing with other groups as well, uh, hear directly from him on what they're working on. And then maybe we could do it as a recap to our clients at the, at the innovation cluster and to our angel members, which is what John and I were talking about before you guys jumped on here today. <laughs> and then John's obviously been doing that, right? John's been part of those yeah. roundtable meetings already. And uh, yes. I think John's done a great job of making sure that our voice is heard. And, you know, one of the unique things about our, our areas, you know, there's lots of angel networks that are in urban centers, but uh, you know, we always put that flair of being rural as well. And we're one of the only rural angel networks and rural innovation uh, or incubators as well. And so we uh, were able to push that. And of course, at the federal level, we also have the uh, Minister of Rural Economic Development is, um, is Mary Munsup as well, right? So I think there's lots of coverage that uh, we've been pushing and we, we play that angle. Sometimes we're urban if we're trying to attract a tech company and sometimes we're rural if we're trying to attack an agriculture or in many cases, government funding as well. Um, I think one of the highlights would be, listen, uh, the, the main message is look, we've invested so much in innovation and technology to have this wonderful country be a leader. Wouldn't it be a shame if we took a step back? And when you see all these amazing companies that are pivoting to help support COVID at their own detriment, um, it really speaks to the value and the character of our startups, but it is like I've, ne I've never been involved like Michael here in the political side, but I, I have been behind the grounds uh, orchestrating these podcasts. And when you when you hear directly from these ministers on their, their commitment, it does make me feel good. Right. So I am very positive and optimistic. And uh, I have opened up my uh, wallet again for investments. Here's the way I look at it. Michael, you said it. 
the companies that I, I'm not worried about my portfolio because the portfolio companies that I chose with my uh, investment firms, they're companies that are going to be sticking around. I use the same thing with the startups. You know, it is going to be tougher, but that's just, that's just good competition. It makes all of us want to be better. So yeah, be on your best. Uh, because I want to invest in companies that are going to be around well beyond the COVID. Great. Thank you. Does anyone want to add to that before I move on to the next question? Okay. It sounds like good stuff is coming. So that's, that's good to hear. That's good news. My next question is what should a startup have prepared um, when they're approaching angel investors and when is the best time to approach angels for investment in your company? Who would like to take that question on first? Yeah, I, I can start on that one yeah. and then maybe Eves can follow up with me right after that or, or Michael. Um, you, you need to have your business completed, your business plan completed. You need to have all your financials completed. Basically, you need to be incorporated up and running. Um, it, sometimes you don't need to be uh, looking at revenue at that point in time. So we do look at pre-revenue companies. You definitely need to have a pitch ready. Um, what we normally do is we uh, pre-screen anybody that goes in front of the angel group in Peterborough. So there is a bit of a process there. So you would contact the angel group or the innovation cluster and then we would go through each of the applicants and then decide who's going to be pre-screened. Once we do the pre-screening, then we will, and we like their business, we will help them polish the, their pitch so that they are presentable in front of the group. We don't want them to be a train smash. So we go through that process. And then once they get through that, then we'll do the final pitch set to the angel group. So. You have to have your pitch ready. You have to have your business plan ready. You have to have your financials done and you need to know the market and you need to know your business. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, but that is a very, very, very good list. Um, that's almost what I would call the blocking and tackling that you have to have done. Of course I should, I, Sometimes I use a, a sports metaphor from my old days, and maybe it doesn't mean anything to people. So <laughs> the, the, the nuts and bolts, you've got to get that stuff done. I will also say, though, that um, it's amazing. We have seen a number, many, many good ideas. I have on the other side of that, only seen what I would say is a few exceptional presentations relative to the number of what I would al almost call exceptional ideas that people have. But without a doubt in my mind, um, the companies that do get and I would say almost without exception, the companies that get funding are the companies that, are, that have great communicators. We started out talking about Ribbit uh, as an example. Great communicators spent inordinate amount of time getting their presentation right, took feedback upon feedback upon feedback started out with jargon and acronyms and things of that nature that that remember the angels are people like like the four people here who sometimes we don't know anything about that technology or whatever a great presentation is your best tool after you've done the the stuff that uh most of you know that you have to do the stuff that john was talking about because if you've had any any feedback from the, a, a cluster or an accelerator or any any of those folks they'll they'll take you through the nuts and bolts of that but um getting yourself to the stage where you've got your elevator pitch or your presentation where it needs to be i can tell you just from my own experience 
including seeing a lot of them and including putting together a lot of them. And the ones that were good, I got response uh, when I did them. And the ones that I was lousy on, I could tell. And I didn't get anything. So I'm just, that's my bias. That's great. Thanks. Would anyone like to add to that? I could add a couple things just, just really quickly. So it really doesn't matter actually whether you're going after angel money, you're going after you know, private equity, any type of money, even loans. There's sort of five factors and five categories that I always see. When I sit there listening to a pitch, I typically have you know, five lines on a piece of paper and I write comments on them. So the first one is, you know, do you know how much money you need? You know, not necessarily how much money you want, but how much do you need? Do you actually know what it's going to take for you to be successful? The second piece is how long do you need that money for? Do you need it for a year, a month, a day? I mean, understanding how long you're going to need to tie up that money for is going to be key. The third thing is when you get to the end and you give that money back because you don't need it anymore, how much are you going to give back? You know, what's going to be the return on investment for the investor? And then the next two buckets are, and I said it earlier, is it's trust and risk. You know, your presentation and, and what even John and Frank were talking about is, you know, how much do we trust that you know your business, that you're going to be successful, you know. Sometimes it's just based on, we invest based on the personality because we know these people will literally work till every hour of every day to get across the line. Sometimes we see people that, you know, you look at them, you're like, you're not going to work that hard. You know, you want to be an entrepreneur because you think that you want the flexible hours. And so it's really that trust and risk factor. And then the fifth one is the wild card, which um, I always suggest to people never to underestimate. So when you look at angels are people, you know, so, you know, if your business relates to something that somebody has an expertise in, maybe a hobby, they're going to be more gravitated towards. Um, sometimes we've got, you know, based on your gender, you know, certain angels may um, want to invest in a certain gender, ethnic, there's, again, it's people, you know, they want to be able to relate to individuals that they're investing inside of. Um, sometimes it's tied to, you know, priorities of the day, you know, you want to give back. And so if it's environmental, you want to be part, as an angel, want to be part of something that's going to do too good. Maybe the story of that uh, particular angel is something that touches your heart and you want to really help them. Maybe they remind you of you, you know, in the past and you want to do that. So that piece is important. And so I think just like anything you do in life, it's, it is a sales process. And so you need to sell your idea in a way that people understand it and it can, they can resonate with it. And if you can do that and you can build that emotional bond, I think there's a much better chance of you of getting money than uh, that if it's just a hard, cold, here's the numbers and here's the facts. Thanks, Mike. Does anyone want to add to that? Or can I move on to the next question? Rose, the only thing I would say is when to approach any time. The beauty about angels is you don't have to have everything in place. That's what the innovation cluster is there for. Eve, you and add me invest in companies you just brought in as a quick introduction. They didn't have a pitch deck. It was just an idea. So talk to angels. They'll help you to get there and they'll prepare you for what angels are looking for. And you're going to have more of a, a result. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Okay, my next question is, I would love to hear from all of you what your um, top tips for startups are. Anyone want to go first? I do it, but very, very quickly. Um, top tips, I mean, be passionate and do what you love. You know, at the end of the day, your passion is always going to come through. You know, you're going to work really long hours. You're going to probably sacrifice some other part of your life, whether it's your recreational, whether it's your family life. I mean, typically startups are going to put every single kind of eggs in, in the basket. And so I think it's really, really important to make sure that you love what you do and, uh, and that you really have a deep desire for it. Because if you're getting into being a startup and it's just because of the money and not because of a passion, um, when things get bumpy down the road, I think you may very well quit. And uh, if you're passionate about something, it'll kind of carry you through. Great tip. Steve, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll sort of beat this one to death, I suppose, about the presentation. Because my interface frequently with, with um, the entrepreneur is at the point where they are presenting to us. So that, ergo, that becomes pretty, uh, pretty key. And uh, I would say, make sure you understand 
and, and communicate a compelling story about what this product does, why it makes someone's life better, uh, why the, whoever the buyer is going to be, the target market, um, <clears throat> why they will be compelled to, to, to purchase. Um, use use fact-based uh, I'll try and explain what I mean by that when you when you make assumptions in your financial or as to how many people uh, what percentage of of the market will be penetrated by your product or whatever attempt to use fact-based support for that Try and find something else in, uh, in the industry or in industry and use that as a, as a, a simile or, or an analogy for if they want, if they're willing to do this over here, then that's why I, because it, there's some similarities, they would be therefore willing to do this in my situation. Anytime you've got some kind of rationale as to why you're making an assumption, that is powerful stuff. Um, and I would also say you you're, always take the, the temperature of the room, if you know what I mean, because you, you want to anticipate questions. So that's part of the practice and getting feedback before you get your presentation in front of the angels. You try and anticipate all the questions, um, but make sure you're watching. Make, ask them if, they un, if they're asking a question or whatever. Ask them if they understand what your answer was. Don't leave any of that stuff on, uh, out so that they, because I, I see it all the time. They glaze over and don't know what, what you're talking about. Most of you folks spend all day, every day, in the space that you're in, in that business. I made this mistake many times myself where you, you think everyone else sort of understands that because you spend so much of your time there. That's not totally true. So keep, keep making sure that you make your presentation simple and you're, you're looking at the target group, which is the angel group, if you're looking to get angel money. And, Make sure they understand what you're saying. Sorry, I'm, I'm blathering about that, but I do believe it in. <laughs> no, that's all great information. Thanks, Eve. Um, would anyone else like to add to uh, tips for startups? Yep, yeah. I'd love Ron? to. Um, yeah, go for it. Mike, Mike made a, a, an excellent point that uh, you have to be a passionate person. And to, to follow up on that is, you also need to really be open to listen to new ideas and, and uh, mentorship from other people. And if you're arrogant, you're not going to be successful because there's a lot of knowledge that is up here in these four people and each and every one of us have made a lot of mistakes as well. So hopefully we have learned through our mistakes and we're willing to give the, that information back to startups and entrepreneurs. And uh, if you take a look at the age group up here, so it, it adds up to quite a big number. And Frank's laughing, you can't hear him, good thing. Um, but yeah, we've all gone through mistakes and we try to relay that back to the, the startups and a lot of them are young and you've gotta be willing and have the openness to listen. And if not, then it, it's going to be a tougher road for sure. Yeah, coachability is definitely a huge piece, I think. Um, Frank, would you like to uh, have the last word on this one? Oh, we got to unmute you here. Um, yeah, listen, I, I, again, I, I'm honored to share the stage with uh, these individuals because everybody brings such a, such a diverse uh, impact you know, opinion. But uh, look, all I would say is right now, it's a great time to refocus. Again, add more value to your business and also build your sales funnel. For me, it's always about sales. Um, on the pitch deck, it is about the pitch deck, but please don't forget that it really comes down to the due diligence. 
So, which is everybody's been talking about, be prepared for that due diligence. Because you can do the best pitch, but if you die at the due diligence, it's over. And that's where usually most fail. Uh, the other thing I would like to add is that right now it's a great time for you. If you're looking for money, reach out to angels. They want to talk with you. We really want to help you. Just for my forehead down, I'm Kevin O'Leary. The rest I'm not. Okay. And then last thing, guys, please. Right now, there's a lot of angels that are talking with the companies that we invested in. So if you have had investment from your angels, reach out, get a conversation going. You'd be surprised how we can help. Maybe it is another round of funding for a period of time. Maybe it is an introduction for another business development. But, but please, don't just wait to do nothing. Vision without execution is nothing but an hallucination. Thomas Edison, I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you guys so much um, for answering all of these questions. We have come to the portion now where we are going to um, open up. I, it, for those of you that are watching, you may have noticed um, I uh, put into the chat box for uh, everyone to ask their questions through the chat. Um, and I'm going to read them to the angels and then um, and they will do their best to answer them for you. So um, the first question that I have is uh, from Rob Nurse, which is what is the timeline for most angels to see a return on their investment? Would anyone like to tackle that one? I had my first exit at uh, one and a half, almost two years, which is like really weird, right? <laughs> uh, traditionally a seven to 10, uh, but I think Michael also touched on that earlier. Um, so I'll defer to Michael. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, angels would love to get a typically a three to four, but typically if you look at all of the studies, it's typically around seven years. We typically get a return. Um, but again, angel money is is expensive, right? So when you're managing your company, you want to manage the fact that, you know, if I'm trying to give an angel, you know, 10 times return or five times return on their money, um, and obviously it compounds as, as you hold their money longer, you know, traditional money is typically cheaper. So you want to sort of, in many ways, pay the angels out as soon as possible and flip them to a less expensive uh, uh, provider if, if you can do that. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to add to that? I think that was a pretty good answer. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna move on to the next question. So um, the next question here is from uh, Jessica Correa. She is, hers is long, okay, ready? Here we go. Despite recent estimates that the global impact investing market will be at least uh, 500 billion within the next decade, most hybrid social entrepreneurs have encountered still are, have encountered still experienced difficulty in raising capital. Solving this challenge will require changes in the mindsets of investors. The question is, how can we connect and network with impact investors? who are comfortable with social enterprise hybrid models and their blend of social value creation and commercial revenue. I'm happy to cover that quickly. So I've, uh, because of some of the things I've been doing the last few months um, unrelated to COVID, I mean, ESG, so environment, uh, social and governance type investment, I think it's gonna be the next lead. I mean, if you take a look at uh, Tesla and the value of Tesla compared to uh, you know GM and Ford, I mean, those type of investments are the ones that are starting to take out. I think millennials are more interested in investing into companies that have, uh, you know, an environmental impact. And at this point in time, you know, millennials typically are having more disposable, you know, COVID unrelated, a more disposable income in a lot of cases, and they're starting to really look at what those companies are doing. So twofold, I think traditional large companies are going to have to reinvent themselves in order to get access to that money. And so partnering with um, or investing into you know, a company that has social change, I think is gonna be something that's critical for them to continue building the same same investor base. And I think, you know, investors themselves and portfolio managers are gonna be in the same boat. I think that their portfolios and EFTs and all of these different funds are gonna be evaluated by the investors on how much they've invested in, in ESG. And so I think, you know, ESG investments are something that's gonna take off in the next uh, next couple of years. Great, thanks, Mike. Does anyone want to add to that before I hop to the next one? Okay, oh, the next comment is from Lindsay Brock. She's saying that she loves the backdrop and um, 
I live in the country, so my uh, internet connection is not great. So I am in the lobby of the Venture North building, sitting in Lindsay's cafe that is not open right now. So thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Emma. I'm currently working on establishing the Freetown Angel Network in Sierra Leone with COVID-19 impacts. It appears Africa will be a new frontier for supply chain and manufacturing. What regions and sectors are attractive for angel investors looking at Africa? And I think Frank mentioned he could uh, speak to this question. Let me just unmute you here. Yeah, hey Emma, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think if you're trying to set up an angel group, first of all, look to uh, the National Angel Capital Organization. They have resources, as does Angel Investors Ontario, to help you with creating that angel group, because every angel group needs members. Uh, but I, I think you're going to have a challenge. Um, one of the things that I do is I go to Italy with the Italian Trade Commission, and I look at some amazing startups. But then when I get back, trying to get angel investors to invest in something overseas that far becomes a challenge. However, there is a trend right now to uh, more investment in overseas companies. So you're seeing some funds pop up here in North America with kind of a liaison between um, uh, overseas and here in North America so that somebody's looking after my investment because we're very hands-on. So you, it's a little bit difficult to be hands-on although today virtually makes it a little bit easier. So my advice would be reach out to the NACO, uh, Angel Investors Ontario, but there is a, a shift and a change with funds being set up because we recognize that there's great uh, investments. It's just that the angel network likes to work within a several hours from where they make the investment. And that's where the challenge becomes. But there is a trend. Uh, and then of course the startup visa program, which is about attracting companies into Canada, administered by NACO. Uh, and that allows a lot of companies to come into Canada and set up shop here. Again, allowing investors to, for that opportunity. I hope that helps. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for answering that question. Uh, the next question that we have is from Patrick. So for someone who is interested in learning more about becoming an angel, but, but who may be gun shy due to knowledge gaps, where and how would you suggest they jump in? And then he said, asking for a friend. Yeah, I can answer John? that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you can go on, th on the innovation cluster website or the brand website and you can make notification there and apply and we'll contact you and discuss it with you. We hold our meetings monthly. So I think our next meeting will be uh, the end of May. So we do bring in guests to see if that's something that you would want to do. And uh, you're more than welcome to attend. So we, we do open that up. I think Eve wants to follow. Eve, let me just unmute you, buddy. Uh, oh, there you yeah. go. Um, yes, uh, I, I'm just following up on what John said. First of all, if you went on the uh, Angel website, you would, I think, see uh, my name and email. You can contact me. I will, I will happily meet with you, like specifically. Um, uh, I guess no, I won't happily meet with you right now. <laughs> virtually, virtually, Zoom. yeah, virtually. Um, but um, our, I mean, it's you. You are more than welcome to uh, in almost every situation. We've not had uh, virtually any that I can remember where we were not um, happy to have you as a guest uh when the meetings actually are in person again hopefully not too too long from now um that's it's a great environment it's a great opportunity we do a little bit of a call it networking but a, uh, a time prior to the meeting and that's a great time to uh, meet the folks in a, in a casual environment then you sit in on presentations now you would do that virtually but it's not scary. It's not uh, uh, anything to uh, feel uh, gun shy about. I, uh, having said that, before I actually joined, um, I felt the exact same way. I was like, oh, these people are involved in some kind of secret society or something. And it's not that, it's not even remotely like that. It's, it's great. And 
it's it's a great learning experience as well as a great opportunity to uh, to meet other folks who are like minded about uh, investing in in tomorrow's uh, great businesses. Hopefully. Thank you. Thanks for the answer to that question. And I can also say. All of the, the brand members are awesome people. So don't feel nervous or shy to speak with any of them. Uh, the next question that we have is from Paul. How would you create the evaluation for angel investment from a market ready IOT product, which we have only just started marketing and have limited revenue? Would anyone like to tackle that one? I'm actually kind of working with Paul on that. So. <laughs> That's a Drawing really good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think for, for that, uh, for the IOT stuff, the, the market is limitless. So the revenue potential is quite large. So it, it's really tough to determine that. Um, I, I think one thing that is good about it already, Paul, is that you do have an interested partner. And if you're trying to work out a valuation for something like that on an early exit, um, I can definitely help you on that uh, specifically. So we can, we can discuss that uh, on off, off this format for sure. Perfect. Thank you, John. Anyone else want to add to that? The, um, at seven angel groups that I can belong to, Rose, I can tell you and share with our audience that the number one stickler always comes down to valuation. The average valuation in Canada in 2018, compiled by NACO, was 3.8 million. The danger you have if somebody early on thinks that you're worth way more than you, you are, you don't get any more funding. And then you gotta do a down round. I always like to say, do a term sheet that is very fair if the value proposition that this company is going to do all these millions of dollars, don't get caught up in the valuation. Sometimes I've seen companies for a million dollars trying to convince an angel group for one year. You know what would convince? Go get some clients. Have your IP. Get your team in order. You know? So, so don't spend as much time on the valuation. Uh, it's important, but I've also seen it be a, a, a no-deal killer, if you will. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so um, I appreciate your answers on those questions. Next up we have, oh, Dave is in the same building as me right now. Hi, Dave. Um, Dan, next up is Dan. Dan is asking, when taking on investment, it feels wrong to want to allocate some of that to paying yourself to cover basic expenses so that you are able to focus without financial strain. Is that expected in investments? Mike? It's a great question. I mean, I think it's it depends on the case. So um, obviously as an angel investor, we want to make sure that you're fully tied in, right? And that you're tied to the business and that you're putting your heart and soul into it. So, you know, when I see an opportunity where someone puts in a, you know, a CEO salary of their startup that's comparable to, uh, to working for Bell Canada, obviously it's a red flag. Um, but for us, we also understand that you need to, to eat. And if you're, you know, if you have to balance a second job with your, with your business you're building and that takes you out of the business you're building that we're going to invest into, I'd rather have, I'd rather invest in that. So I think it's got to be fair. You have to be upfront about it. And I think that's probably the key thing is, you know, you need to say, listen, this is where I feel my compensation is going to be. This is what I think it's worth, you know, try and back it up maybe with some, some background information on why you feel that. And, uh, and a lot of times, again, it's a line item that investors are going to look at pretty closely um, because it's a test of the kind of person and your dedication in some ways, um, which goes back to that whole trust factor and the ties into the model. And I guess the only thing I'd say second to that is obviously every dollar that you spend on yourself um, is less money that's going into your company, but it's also more investment money you need to bring in, which means you have less equity in the end. So you've got to kind of balance off that paradigm as well. Great answer. I saw Eve maybe wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I was just going to add uh, from personal experience. I've I've been in situations where um, the 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 founder or whatever uh, in early stage was overpaying themselves, and it it, it turned into a, a disaster, frankly. Um, but I've also frequently 
seen, and even when I was uh, doing early stage fundraising myself, uh, been in situations where they would ask, okay, so what are you paying yourself? And if, if it was negligible, because sometimes it was like, no, we're not paying ourselves. The, um, I had a lot of pushback on that too, which was keep it reasonable, but you have to, you have to, uh, they wanted to see that, that you were, you had something to eat and so on. And uh, they thought that that was not a negative. I, I, I'm not sure if that was the angle where, where that question was coming from, but they didn't think that, you know, a, a, as Mike said, a very reasonable salary that was not viewed as something negative. Great. Thank you guys for your answer. Um, we have another question, which is from Rob. He says, I feel I know my market exceptionally well and can get all kinds of stats on my industry. However, for financials on my idea uh, is really difficult to figure out due to the possible magnitude of what this idea could lead into. I have no idea on how to take my business now to the direction that another type of business would need to be. I can add a bit to that. I mean, obviously, it's tough to evaluate your business. I mean, that's, that's, but that's, as an angel investor, it's what we're looking for. I mean, I would say based on that comment, you're probably a bit premature to, uh, to come to an angel investment. I think what you need to do at that point in time is, is work with the cluster and our capacity to really flush out that business and make sure you have a solid business plan. You know, you, one thing I'm going to, I'm going to say, which is a little off topic, but I think it's important. If you look at the history of every angel investment presentation we've ever had, Anybody who's come twice, so came, didn't, did not receive money and came back a second time, didn't get it. Even in some cases where I think those opportunities probably should have. So you, you really have one opportunity. And so, you know, myself, John and Eve, you know, we'll do the pre-screening typically before you come into the angel network. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of times when we send people back to us and say, listen, you're not ready to, to go to the angels because A, you're not going to get investment money and B, you're going to blow your chance of getting investment money. So go back and work with us. So you get a recap, you need to know your business, you need to know its potential and you need to be solid on that because you want people to take a risk in you. And if you don't have that information, it's hard to for someone to take a risk at, into your business because you haven't established them. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Um, the next question, and it looks like the last question unless anybody wants to sneak in any more questions, uh, is from Jordan. Um, Jordan says, how do you anticipate COVID will change customers' behavior in the coming months and years? Does anyone want to weigh in on that? It's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> Eve? <laughs> well, I mean, I, God, I wish I, uh, I, I knew the answer to that because then I'd, uh, know exactly what to invest in. Um, the, uh, it, you know, the, I, I, I guess I, there's so little to compare this to, but I remember after 9-11, um, many, many people here will have been too young for that, but I remember literally getting on a plane. That happened in uh, September. I got on a plane to go to New York in, October, interestingly enough, because I was making a uh, pitch. And um, I was one of about four people on that plane. And I remember the, the uh, flight attendant, before he even took off, said, here, do you want a drink? People were so afraid to fly, so afraid to even go anywhere near an airport, to go anywhere near New York, let alone uh, imagine anywhere else. And after a period of time, just the way human nature is and so on, that of course people got back to flying to, I guess, you know, last year more people flew than any time in the history of mankind. So there, I hope uh, that this too shall pass. Obviously there will be a, uh, if there's a, a 
a vaccine, it will be hugely significant. But I think, um, you know, I think probably I've taken my last cruise, <laughs> but probably not a heck of a lot more than that. Well, I will still travel and so on if that, uh, if I feel safe. If I could add to that, I think it, it also depends on who your customers are, right? I mean, covered customers pretty pretty wide. I mean, if I owned a mall right now, I might be a bit concerned, or an event center for that matter. But uh, but again, you know, in Jordan's case, I mean, it's virtual reality. Um, I think less people are going to get on an airplane. Virtual reality might very well fit. So I think you need to, to think that at the end of the day, our, you know, our customers are humans, and human nature drives a lot of our buying. And so we need to clearly you know understand our client and. Uh, and adapt but uh, but to see what Eve says I think you know people humans have a short memory really I mean at the end of the day I think you know fast forward another six months year whatever it is um, I think this will pass just as the Spanish flu and all of the other many pandemics over the over the years have passed um, but I do think that you know the business community is going to be driven to learn from it and I can pretty sure that every hospital will have much more PPE on on standby I suspect um, you know, back in, in the early 2000, you know, a lot of big corporations did a SARS plan. Um, I think you're going to find that pandemic planning is going to be a, a key occupation for people to get into. Um, I think you're going to see, you know, a lot of people take a step back to see how you're prepared and what's the preparedness for this. Because just like governments, I mean, you kind of get away with making a mistake once if you're not ready. But if you're not ready the second time, then uh, it's much bigger. And so I think there's going to be lots of opportunity and there's going to be lots of ways to differentiate based on your ability to respond to um, a future pandemic, which might be different than your, than your competitor. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think that's our last question. So I, um, I want to wrap it up by honestly saying a huge thank you to our um, speakers. You guys are so lucky to be able to actually hear from them and they didn't hold anything back. They said everything that was on their minds and, and that's really cool to be able to have that type of insight, especially as a startup. Um, a couple things before we sign off, I wanted to thank all of you for attending. Please make sure that you fill out our survey. Let us know what you liked about this session, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see more of in terms of our um, next sessions. Um, and as well, I'm just going to pop right up on the screen here. Um, at, um, I just wanted to spread the word that you can continue this conversation if you would like um, through NACO, the NACO Roundtable series that Frank was speaking about. Feel free to reach out to Spank, or Frank if you would like more information about that. Um, but the next one is coming up uh, Thursday, April 30th. Um, at noon, okay? So you can head to the NACO website. If you are more interested in um, speaking with the Peterborough Region Angel Network, you can head to this contact information on the screen. Um, you can always go to the Angel website so that you can speak with the angels directly. Or of course, you can touch base with the innovation cluster um, if you would like information regarding that as well. And um, for anyone else that's interested, we do have more workshops coming up. We have a business and financial planning workshop on May 6th with RBC, as well as a marketing and selling workshop coming up on May 14th. You can head to our website or any of our social media channels uh, to register for those. And um, if you'd like to become a client of the Innovation Cluster, you can go to our website, innovationcluster.ca slash application. Um, again, I want to thank all of our panelists, Mike, John, Eve, and Frank. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. And um, I hope that we get the opportunity to speak with everyone again soon. Please have a lovely, wonderful rest of your afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye.